We had the advantage of taking independent positions on uh, conflicts, even if the great powers and NATO members were involved. Welcome, Jan Eliasson. It's an honor to introduce you. You're a very well-known diplomat. You have served as the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations and as Sweden's Foreign Minister. And your work in international affairs has been remarkable and really shows your deep commitment to diplomacy and humanitarian causes. And uh, today we talk about NATO and about Sweden becoming a NATO member as we speak. And if we just briefly start with why did Sweden choose to apply for NATO membership back in 2022? Thank you, Steph, for inviting me. And uh, most of all, I'm proud of being former chair of CIPRI board, of course, and uh, I'm very happy to keep this connection with you. Um, it's a, it was a very important step and a very difficult step to take because we have had this policy for over 200 years of in neutrality and non-alignment. So it was a, in, in a way even a painful step. But uh, the uh, Russian aggression made this situation different and changed public opinion also very radically, not only in Sweden but also in Finland, which is even more exposed to Russia. And when the aggression took place and then was followed by war crimes, and we more and more realized that this was a, a, a democracy uh, that was attacked, then uh, we came to a rather general conclusion in the Swedish political life that uh, we had to build our security on collective security. And NATO, the same choice as our Baltic and Nordic friends, was the obvious choice then. But as I said, it wasn't an easy no. decision. No, and obviously, like you said, 200 years of peace in Sweden and Sweden non-aligned. Mm -hmm. What do you think has been the biggest advantage of Sweden being non-aligned? Well, I was part of that policy my whole diplomatic life mm -hmm. and proudly represented uh, neutral or non-aligned Sweden. We had the advantage of taking independent positions on uh, conflicts, even if the great powers and NATO members were involved, like the United States and Vietnam and so forth, but also Russia and Afghanistan. And we prided ourselves of taking those independent positions. We also had a, a rather progressive agenda, mm -hmm. I would say. We uh, supported uh, generous uh, development assistance, supported uh, gener generous uh, humanitarian assistance, supported uh, disarmament initiatives, and generally took a very active stance on, on human rights. Mm. And that altogether gave us uh, many friends, some who were less friendly when they were exposed to Swedish criticism, not least by Olof Palme, who was uh, the legendary prime minister standing up for this uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis the third world. But um, uh, it was, as I said, a decision that was supported by a great majority of Sweden when we decided to apply to for NATO membership. Yeah, and if you were wishing like what role Sweden could assume now to keep many of the elements which you say in its NATO role now, what, what could we do? I think this positively? is a very important uh, challenge and a challenge that we should accept, namely to keep as much as possible of the elements that we uh, uh, we were active in uh, doing internationally. To me, it, it seems obvious that we must continue an active policy on human rights, uh, that we should stand up for solidarity with the poor part of the world, development assistance and humanitarian assistance. And I also even believe as NATO member we could uh, have a progressive uh, policy on disarmament and armaments and arms mm -hmm. trade, issues that we have worked with at uh, CIPRI, not least. Because uh, we can look at Norway, a uh, member of NATO, which has uh, a very uh, progressive and open policies in these issues. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some issues that are uh, somewhat uh, complicated for a NATO member. If you look at the nuclear issues and uh, politically in Europe, unfortunately, the migration and refugee issue but I think we should uh, not uh, sort of go in the direction of accepting that uh, NATO does our foreign policy. On the, uh, on, co on the contrary, we should try to influence, together with the other Nordics, not least, the uh, policies of NATO. 
Yeah, I think that is also a very good uh, point which you make, that the Nordic countries in itself have, have been some sort of special group also historically. And do you think the Nordic brand can be stronger or how do you also see the I'm foundation great, of this uh, brand? I'm a great uh, champion of the Nordic corporation cause. Uh, all my life I have thrived on, on that issue and uh, it is so satisfying also because Nordic Corporation has complete uh, popular support. European Union, 52, 48, whatever in the, uh, in the, in, in the polls or in the uh, referendum. But Nordic Corporation is natural because this is our brothers and sisters. We are united by history. Uh, we mm. are united by geography. And I would say we are united by values and principles. And uh, we have very strong democratic traditions which come from popular support of pop popular movements. And uh, we have, mm. it's so easy to agree. So I would say that one of the advantages of uh, the NATO membership is that we now, all five Nordic countries have the same security policy basis. Mm foundation and that would give us an opportunity to play a role inside NATO as five Nordic countries with that tradition not least in the area of uh, popular democracy of democracy which is supported in broad circles and uh, which gives everybody a chance in a society then there is another area which I would say will be a growing security uh, importance namely the Arctic area yeah if you look at the Arctic area and the countries that border to the Arctic area, you find Russia, of course, Canada, United States, partly. But the Nordic countries are definitely in that league because you have Norway with Svalbard, you have uh, Denmark with Greenland, you have uh, Iceland, which is already there in the Arctic area, Finland and, uh, and Sweden, which have Arctic areas also. So we could develop and play an active role in, for instance, uh, stopping a militarization mm. of uh, the Arctic area or reducing the uh, mineral exploitation in that area for environmental reasons. So we have an opportunity to strengthen mm. uh, the Nordic cooperation, I would say. That's great. That is indeed, like you say, probably even easier now when we are indeed. part of NATO. Indeed. That's, that's really good. Um, is there anything which you are careful about what we should avoid now as Sweden coming into NATO? Is there anything which you think we really have to pay attention? Well, of course, we have in some uh, people's eyes uh, a tradition of uh, believing that we, <laughs> we will set the direction <laughs> both at the UN and European Union and other organizations in which I've served. So I, I would s advise my uh, diplomatic colleagues to go slow in the beginning and listen and take the temperature and learn from the other NATO members in the beginning, look at the organization and then decide on the role we should play. But once we, are, uh, we have warmed up, uh, we should not uh, be a sort of a, a shy violet. Uh, we, mm. should, uh, we should stand up for values and take positions. But uh, I s it's always a rule that I have that in the beginning of a time in an organization, even as a person, mm. you should l listen and learn the first three to six months. Yeah. Thank you, Jan, really. This has been very insightful. And uh, thank you for the great perspectives you shared with us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.